that essentially supports high performance computing and other research computing needs for the university. Uh, quick introduction to who we are. We, um, about 20 people, and we uh, operate all the compute clusters for the university and help all the users use them, as well as other sort of related um, high-end research computing needs. Um, I'm gonna be presenting today for the first half, followed by Ben Evans, my colleague, who's also a research support analyst. Uh, he'll do the second half, the more interesting half, I'm sure. Um, couple notes before I get started. Uh, we think that we have got everybody muted uh, so as to avoid um, any kind of problems. Um, there's a group chat that you can use for questions. Uh, you should see that. So if you post questions there, hopefully I'll notice, and if not, probably Christine or Ben will, and let me know. Uh, if you wanna follow along, uh, you, you can certainly do so directly inside the Zoom uh, window, which is probably the best way actually. But after we're done here, uh, the URL, which will still work, is, is this here, docs, ycrcel edu, our novice gap finder. So that is uh, where this whole presentation is. Uh, let me just show you, um, let's see, I'm gonna go here first. So we're gonna talk about uh, several different uh, sort of sub chapters here. I'm gonna do the first two, introduction and the data structures, and then Ben will do the rest. Uh, let me show you um, a little bit of setup information first. So we initially envisioned this class as an in-person class, which unfortunately it is not. Um, had we done it in person, it might have made sense for us to have you each install R in our studio ahead of time because we would have been around to help you troubleshoot that if you had problems. Uh, given that that's not the case, we decided that it made more sense to not ask you to do that as part of this. And so, uh, the, um, while I am going to use R in our studio um, in my installation, um, we're not asking you to do that. Um, the, the simplest thing for you to do is simply to follow along and just watch me. If you really want to have your own instance of our studio and you don't already have it installed, uh, you can try using Binder. So this launch button here will launch essentially a version of our studio in an Amazon instance in the cloud and uh, will give you a working R environment uh, that is essentially identical to mine and should allow you to do the same things that I'm doing. Um, not sure that makes sense. Um, it'll be more juggling, so you can use your own um, your own uh, sense about that. But it, it, that this will also work afterwards. So if you want to easily try some stuff without having to do a bunch of installation, this would be a uh, a good way to do that. Uh, if this is the first time I've done uh, Skype, uh, sorry, uh, a Zoom course on this particular setup. So uh, please reach out if you can't understand me or if something isn't working right. Okay. So let's get started with uh, the, first, um, the first chapter of this presentation. Just going to scan through this. So um, the first thing I want to show you is our studio. Now um, it's worth just giving you a little bit of background here. R is a is a, a a language, a computer language, programming language, and you can certainly use R without having anything to do with R Studio. And in fact, for many years, that's what I did. Um, you can write programs in R by writing commands into a file and then executing those those commands in a sort of normal way. And you can also just start up an R console just by typing R and um, starting to type R into that. But I think um, R Studio will be helpful to you as you begin because it, it gives you a, um, 
a lot of context, a lot of tools that make, make things easier. So um, our studio is essentially a development environment, um, it's called an IDE, that uh, rests on top of R and, and gives you a lot of help, gives you sort of a lot of tools for, uh, for working with R. And this is a pretty common thing. Most modern programming languages have IDEs for them. And R Studio is the most uh, popular one for R. So this is what you'll see when you bring up R Studio. Um, you'll see several panels. Um, on the left here is a panel that is essentially an R session. And R likes to use the greater than sign as a prompt. So basically this is R waiting for you to ask it to do something. So that's really identical to what you would see if you were doing a standard, if you just ran R in a command line. Um, but over here, you've got some other stuff that you wouldn't have if you were running uh, a standard R. You've got a pan panel here that's gonna show you your environment. So as you assign variables and build up data structures, you'll be able to see them and explore them here. And then here is kind of a general purpose pane that lets you view all kinds of things, plots and files, um, help, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see it's got multiple uh, tabs here. And um, we'll see that that's sort of a generally helpful area, okay? So um, typically what you'll do then is you'll open up a file, an R script file, and then we end up with a fourth panel. So it kind of divides this left hand into two pieces. Uh, the bottom is what it was before. The bottom is just an R session, an R console session. And the top is a file uh, that you can start putting R um, code into, uh, which will um, save it in that file, but also allows you in place to execute that code. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in just a second how you do that. So th this is a sort of nice way to do things because um, you, you have a transcript in, in essence of what you've been doing. And um, you can write stuff here and very quickly and easily cause it to be executed down here. Okay, so, so let me actually show you that. So here is my own um, R Studio. And right now I don't really have anything in it, but I could uh, type the world's um, simplest little bit of R. I'll add four, sorry, four plus four. Um, Hang on, four plus four. And um, I can execute that code by hitting run here. And you can see down here, it's actually um, copied what the expression that I wrote and given me the result here. Um, I can also some shortcuts for this. So I can do control return, which will do exactly the same thing as uh, clicking on run here. So that happens and I can actually execute multiple lines of code at the same time by highlighting them and clicking run, okay? Or uh, hitting, again, control return. So uh, that's uh, the basic operation here in the R Studio, And you'll see as I go along um, some more interesting uses of it. I can clean up things here a little bit so it doesn't get messy. Um, I can just delete these lines here in the usual way, just using delete. And um, down here, control L will uh, clean up the console. So um, there are a couple of, of sort of main flows that you can do within R Studio. Uh, the first is just use that bottom console directly. Uh, um, so that would mean coming down here and just typing stuff. That's fine and not bad for exploration, but the problem is you kind of lose what you've done. It isn't, it isn't uh, uh, recorded in any kind of reasonable way. And that's why um, in some ways it's more uh, reasonable, a better approach to um, open up an R file and start writing into that file and then using the uh, shortcut keys to, to actually run the snippets of code. So that's what I was just showing you. And I think that's a pretty good way uh, once you've built up the code and you've got it all debugged, then you can either import it, you'll see um, perhaps later, but anyway, there's this uh, R command called source that will read in an entire R file and run it, or you could um, just uh, run an entire R script 
using um, uh, ours command line um, version of running. Okay. So R is fundamentally an interpreted language. And so whenever you see that greater than sign here, it's basically waiting for you to give it something to do. So, you know, at any point we can um, ask it to um, execute something just like I've been doing. So what are some things that we could do? Well, uh, we can do some very simple arithmetic, which is what I've been showing you so far. So simple things like, um, you know, add some numbers together and get the result. Now, one thing you'll, you'll see as you use our, there's this kind of cryptic thing that uh, comes in front of most of the outputs that you see. And um, it's a little puzzling. Um, we'll get to what that is later. For now, just ignore it. Um, well, when I explain uh, what this really is, it'll make sense why there's a one there. Uh, you can, um, in many cases, type a partial command and hit return. And if R is smart enough to figure out that uh, there's more coming, it'll change the prompt to a plus sign. And at that point, you can type some more stuff. So I, I can show you that. Uh, up a little bit here. If I do one plus and hit return, you can see that the prompt is changed to a plus and I can finish the command and go ahead and run it and get the expected result. If you have typed something and you want to uh, get rid of it, you want to kill it, cancel that command. Um, they're unfortunately slightly different depending on whether you're doing it in our studio or on the command line. In our studio, you use escape. So if I say four plus five plus, and I say, shoot, that was a mistake. If I just hit escape, um, I actually hit two things there. Let me do it again. Hit escape, and um, it basically cancels that command. If you were on a plain old command line, it, turned out, it turns out escape would not work. Um, what you would do is command C, uh, control C. Control C is the, kind of the usual catch-all way of, of um, stopping what you're currently doing. And, and it's true for R as well. Now, when you're using R as a calculator, um, as you probably know from other contexts, the order of operations can matter. And so, for example, if we look at this um, expression here, there are two ways you might possibly interpret that. You could interpret it as eight times two or three plus 10. And just like in pretty much every um, mathematical language or programming language that I'm familiar with, the way they handle that is by setting up a precedence of operators so that, um, and most languages have the, roughly the same precedence. And that is that, um, Multiplication has precedence over addition, for example. So in this case, uh, this is going to evaluate to 3 plus 10 or 13. So um, this is a, a very um, short list of the precedence rules in R. There are actually a lot more precedence rules than this, uh, but this, these are the most important ones, arguably. Uh, so um, you can always set your own precedence with parentheses because parentheses have the highest precedence. So, so that sort of um, always wins. And then below that you have expo exponentiation, multiply and divide. This is actually slightly incorrect. Multiply and divide have the same precedence. They're equal. And add and subtract are also equal. And so if you um, don't put any parentheses, you're gonna get the default um, precedence, which we just talked about. And if you wanted something different, you can use parentheses like this. And sometimes people use parentheses just to make things clearer if they think, especially if you get into some kind of the, some of the stranger precedence rules, they think maybe the reader won't um, naturally know what the right precedence is. And so just make it clearer. So for example, these each of these three expressions 
actually specify the same computation and have the same uh, resulting value because um, naturally this has the highest precedence uh, than this and then this. Um, a side comment here, so to speak, um, any line of code can have a, a pound sign in it and everything after the pound is considered a comment. So R will just ignore it. So we could actually grab all of this and throw it in my R Studio session here. I'm gonna do this kind of the hard way and then go ahead and run it. And you can see that it calculated 23 all three times. Let me clean this all up. Okay. Um, another thing that you'll run into is that R uh, will sometimes print numbers out in scientific notation. So for example, if you generate a pretty small uh, decimal point number, um, it will print it out this way uh, rather than with a, a lot of zeros after a decimal point. And it kind of decides what a really small number or a really large number is. Um, one thing I'll mention here is that in, in R, uh, all numbers are um, floating point numbers. They're actually doubles um, unless you explicitly make them be integers. We'll see that in a minute. So this, what this really is saying is take the number the floating point number two and divide it by the point number 10,000. Um, you can also write uh, numbers in scientific notation yourself, like this. So uh, that is the equivalent of writing that. Okay. All pretty straightforward. The uh, next thing I want to show you is. Uh, some mathematical functions. R is rich in functions. They have functions for everything. Uh, there's a lot of functions having to do with um, statistics, since R is a very statistically oriented language. These are some other math and trigonometry functions. Uh, they give you a sense of how to use functions. So the idea of the function, very simple. You say the name of the function and give the parameters, the input, arguments to the function, and uh, you'll get the result like this. So this is the sine of one. This is uh, the log of one. Now you might ask, well, which log is this? R decided that the default log is the natural log, but um, it's easy enough to get the log base 10 this way. Um, and you can also get um, e to some power using the exponentiation function. So let me show you that in my R studio here. So if I say log of, um, let's see, let's do log base 10 of 10, and uh, we get the expected one. Um, a nice thing about R studio is you can get documentation right inside of it. So if I was Trying to remember what what does log do? So I, I can type a, a question mark and the name of any function, and it'll give me everything that partially matches that, which is a fair number of things. And I come over here and um, I can see the beginnings of the documentation. My screen is a little small here, so this is a little tight. But what I can do to make things a little better is I can do as it says there, um, F1, and that opens up the documentation here in this um, fourth panel that I briefly mentioned. And here is uh, all the documentation for log. Few words about our documentation. Um, our documentation can be a challenge to read, in my opinion, and um, it's a bit of a learning curve. One thing that they they do that's a little surprising is they'll have, as they did in this case, a page that combines a lot of related functions in one page. So even though I asked for log, what I'm getting here is all the log functions and all the exponentiation functions and kind of how they all work. So it turns out that log is a sort of more complicated than we thought. Log isn't pure 
purely a natural log. It's actually a function that will do the log to any base. Um, it just turns out that by default, it'll do it to a base of E. So that's what all of this complicated stuff is. Um, don't worry too much. Um, you'll get used to it, but I just wanted to point out that um, uh, when you get this documentation, you may get slightly more than you're asking for. Okay. Um, moving on to comparing things. Um, you, there are expressions for saying, do things equal? Do they not equal? Are they greater than one another? And so forth. So these are all um, expressions that result in a Boolean value. So here I'm saying one is, is, I'm asking the question, is one equal to one? It is, so I get a true. And so forth for these other operators. So we have um, equal to, greater than, uh, less than, not equal to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that um, double equal is what we used for testing for equality, not a single equal. Uh, we'll talk about single equal a little bit in a minute. Uh, this is a very common potential source of error, um, not only in R, but in many programming languages where it's very common to use uh, double equal as the test of equality. So just keep that in mind. Two equals is how you say, is this value equal to that value? Okay. So I can run a couple of those quickly. Nothing too surprising there. Six, six is greater than four. It is, let me clean this up. Six greater than four, yes. And is uh, six equal to itself? Yes. Uh, this is really a little bit of an aside, but you should always be careful testing equality on floating point numbers. Um, because floating point numbers, generally speaking, are only approximations. And so even though two numbers might have been calculated so that in theory they're the same, if they're represented as floating points, uh, they could be slightly different. There could be a small uh, rounding error, numerical error, and they're not, strictly speaking, equal. Um, so this is, again, something that is a, an issue across all programming languages. R took a kind of interesting approach to this. Um, which is that they created another operator function um, called all equal, which is, you could think of it as a fuzzy equal. So you give it a, um, multiple values, and if they're all pretty equal within its definition, um, it'll result true. Um, probably you'll never need that, but I thought I would uh, mention it to you. And there's more information here if you're curious. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is learn how to assign variables. So set, uh, calculate some value and set a variable equal to that. Essentially give that value a name is the, kind of the way I think about it. So here we're going to calculate the value of 1 divided by 40 and set the variable x to it. So if we do that, and I'll go ahead and do that here in my R studio. So um, x gets 1 divided by 40. So we run that, and um, you can see it was executed down here, but nothing was um, printed out. It didn't print out the value. And that's just the way R decides to, to handle assignment statements. It, it doesn't print out any value. I can, of course, print a value out by just uh, typing the name of the variable. So now you can see here uh, that this is what it calculated. Um, now, excitingly enough, over here we actually have something. So in our environment, in this panel, you can see that it knows that x um, has been assigned the value 0 0.025. So we can start to see why this panel is, is useful because it's going it's to collect all the values as I assign them. Okay. So now that I have this 
uh, variable x, I can use it in further calculations instead of using the number itself. So I can, for instance, say what is the log of x and get some output. And I can overwrite the current value of x uh, with another value like 100. So if I go ahead and do both those things here, I can say what, what's the log of x. And I can say x gets 100. And now we can see that over here in my panel, um, x has a, its new value. Uh, you can use the same variable on the right and left hand side of the assignment. So uh, this is basically incrementing x by one. I could do that. x gets x plus one. Now x is 101. Um, I can uh, create a new variable with an expression using an, a, var a variable I already have. Y gets x times 2. And now um, we have y defined. S few words about what are valid variable names. Variable names can be made up of combinations of letters, numbers, underscores, and periods. So that's pretty restrictive. There's a lot of stuff you can't put in a variable name. You can't put, for instance, a dash. You can't put a percent sign. You can't put a dollar sign. Um, just these few things um, can be combined. And then there are a few more um, restrictions. The first uh, element of the name has to either be uh, a period or a letter. So they can't begin with underscores uh, or numbers. Um, furthermore, um, or something else to say, I guess, is that um, sometimes it's useful. So far you've seen me use variable names that are very short, just X and Y. Well, that works really well for very small programs. But once you, know, you start building up more variables and the variables uh, should have meaning, you'll find yourself wanting to use words or even multiple words to name your variables. And so then um, the question comes, how do, how do I take multiple words and combine them into a meaningful variable name? And here's a couple of suggestions. Um, you can use a period in between the words or underscores, or this is a, a kind of classic um, convention people use called camel case, where uh, you capitalize the first letter of each of the words. Just, just be consistent. Something else that you're gonna run into, and um, you will see this, it turns out you don't have to use that left arrow to do assignment. Um, you can use an equal sign like this. Now, recall that double equal is used for checking equality. So here, this is a single equal. Um, this means assign one over 40 to X. Um, I think this was done just because so many programming languages use equal for assignment that uh, they decided to allow people to do that as well. I would recommend that you steer away from it and just be consistent and use the left arrow. But the most important thing is, um, and this is a generally true statement, when you write one body of code, try to be consistent throughout it. So that, that includes um, dealing with which assignment operator you use, um, how you name variables, um, how you do indentation, all kinds of things like that. So uh, just make your code easy to read by being consistent. Um, Rob, can I interject real quick? You bet. Uh, the probably the the rarest thing that you would see, but still valid, <laughs> and so just uh, to know that it exists is you can actually point the arrow the other direction as well. Yeah. So you could write ten arrow towards X, and okay. that would also. So 10. I have never actually seen that in real life, but, um, but it's an amusing thing to know about. So yeah. if you want to confuse or amaze your friends, <laughs> do that as well. Yeah. But don't right, do it continue. in real code, please. Yeah, yeah. don't, don't right. do it. But if someone has, you'll, at least you'll know that it, that's what it means. Yeah, thanks, Ben.
Okay, so um, just to make sure everyone's still awake, um, here's a little quiz. Here are eight variables, ver potential variable names or proposed variable names, and some of them are legal variable names and some of them aren't. So just take like 15 seconds and look at that and see if you can pick out some that are uh, not legal based on the rules that I said. Okay, let's take a look. So um, these four are perfectly fine. They all begin with a letter and um, only contain letters, periods, underscores, and numbers. Um, let's drop down to the bottom here. These three are all illegal. Um, this one begins with an illegal character. This one contains an illegal character. And this one begins with an illegal character with a, a number. We can't begin with a number. This one is kind of weird, and I don't think this is terribly important, but uh, if, you, if you begin a variable name with a period, it's a legal name, but it's a hidden variable. And uh, so many ways of displaying variables will ignore it, including our studio here. So if I were to say um, dot x gets five, um, I did assign dot x, and I can go ahead and look at it, but you can see over here on the right, it doesn't show up in, uh, in the environment. So that's a trick to hide variables. I've never actually seen that done in real life. Okay, um, I think I'll just take a five second pause here and see if anybody has any questions so far. Just let me catch my breath. Okay, I don't see any. Um, I promise you this will get more interesting as we get more into the, the more serious R stuff, but we're just trying to set sort of the basis here first. Okay, so um, I actually think the vectorization is kind of interesting. So um, this is a place, R is a very quirky language. Uh, I, will, I will tell you right here, it's, it's very powerful, it's very interesting does things that most other languages don't, uh, does certain things that other languages don't do natively. And this is probably the most important of those things. Um, that, that the idea of vectors and vector operations is built directly into the language, is very nicely expressed and is really efficient. And so um, good R programmers writing good R code will make very heavy use of this. It's a little bit, um, weird the first time you run into it though. So I just want to sort of um, introduce it to you. The simplest way to make a vector is shown here. There are a lot of ways to make vectors. Um, this is the simplest and this will automatically make a vector of five numbers going from one to five. So you can think of this as a range. It's specifying a range as a, as a vector and this is the output. So that, that seems pretty intuitive. I would say this does not seem so intuitive. So, so what's going on here? Let's, let's actually, well, we can see the output here. This is what the output is. So if you look at the output, you can probably kind of figure out what it actually did, but you might not have guessed that by just looking at this. It's kind of odd. So, so essentially what it's doing, it's vectorizing the operation of um, uh, exponentiation here. So it's basically giving you five, it's doing five um, uh, evaluations in parallel. It's, it's taking two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, two to the four, two to the five, and uh, creating a new output vector that has those values in it. Okay, so that's pretty much all that's going on here. It just looks a little strange. Um, and you can assign a vector to a variable and use it exactly the same way. So, so this is exactly the same uh, execution as as what I did here. It's just first storing um, the vector into this variable and then using the variable name and getting the same value. So let's do this for real over here. Clean this up a little bit. Um, two to the one through five. Now, now um, what happens if I don't 
put these parens in here. So we can see that um, the precedence rules clearly show that, that this um, exponentiation took um, precedence because this was the same as Right. Um, so going back to what I started with here, um, what if I reverse things? What if I said one through five? Again, I need to worry about the precedence. So if I do that, I essentially square all the values from one to five. So it's, it's also a vector operation. It's just uh, the, kind of the reverse vector operation. So um, what we've done here is, is very straightforward. Um, just you know, vectors of, of simple integers and simple functions. Um, but um, hopefully later on, you'll see that, that uh, vectorization is an incredibly powerful tool in, uh, in R. Okay, a couple of kind of housekeeping functions that you may find useful. Uh, one is ls. So what ls does is it, um, it prints all of the variables that you have in your environment. So for those of you who work in Linux, you may say, oh, ls sounds like I'm listing my current directory. Well, that's not what it does, um, although does something kind of similar, it, it lists all the elements of your current environment. Uh, so I can go ahead and do that. If I say ls, um, I get x and y because that's currently what's in my environment, uh, x and y. Um, now, you might slip up and just type ls. And what happens then is kind of strange. And this could happen to you for any function. Maybe you type log. So what happens when you do, if you type the name of a function um, without any parentheses, it actually prints out the definition of the function. And if it's a, a pure R function, which LS is, you get a ton of R spewed out. Um, so this is kind of an, also kind of a quirky thing about R that, um, that the uh, definition of, or the value of a function name is its actual definition in R. So you'll get the R code out. It can be useful. I think you'll find that most R code written by uh, the people who wrote the R package is more complicated than you feel like dealing with. Um, this has got a lot of stuff in it. Um, but it, it's, it can be useful if you write your own functions that typically are gonna be simpler and, um, by just uh, typing the name of the function, you'll get the, the definition of the function back. That I have actually found useful. Um, finally, you can remove uh, variables from your environment using the rm function. So if you say R, rm of x, then x will be destroyed, that variable will be destroyed and the uh, memory that it was using will be freed uh, back to uh, the environment. So that can occasionally be useful uh, if you're working with very, very large data structures and you need, you're sort of in danger of running out of memory and you'd like to clean up your variables. I will say that uh, R has a built-in garbage collector. And so as long as you, um, essentially get rid of any reference that you have to the variable, R should take care of memory cleanup itself. But there are cases where it won't do that, and so an explicit cleanup using RM can be useful. Uh, you can combine these two things in kind of clever way. You can say, I want to remove everything by doing this. Um, I have to say, this is a little bit of a, an advanced uh, usage right here. It turns out RM, what RM normally wants is the, just the plain old variable names like this. And what LS gives you is um, essentially uh, a vector of characters. And so uh, you need to invoke RM with a kind of alternative 
input list. I don't think I want to go into the details of that, but um, this um, this would work to clean up your environment. Okay. Um, another important topic: packages in R. So the base R has kind of all the basic elements of the language, and um, typically an R installation that you do will have a, a bunch of the most important packages already installed in it. Packages are collections of code. Um, think of them like sort of like libraries. Um, they, they're basically, um, you know, a collection of different functions to do a particular thing. And there are, um, as the slide here says, over 10,000 packages available on the repository. So CRAN is the um, R repository. If you do anything with R, you'll get to be good friends with CRAN. It's, it's basically where all the packages are stored. And you'll find eventually that you need um, some package installed in your version of R that isn't there now. And so you'll want to install it. And that turns out to be pretty easy. Usually you just say install packages and the name of the package. And um, R usually does a pretty good job of figuring out if there are dependencies, other dependencies for the package you want that it also needs to install. And it'll do that. There are, so that's the one you'll mostly use. Uh, you, you can query what packages are currently installed this way. Um, you can um, update or remove packages, et cetera. You know, the pretty classic thing that happens is you, you, know, you get some code from somebody or, or, or you get some idea that you wanna do and you run into the problem that you don't have the required package, just go ahead and do an install packages. And um, most of the time that'll work out. Okay, um, before, so we're almost at the end of, of the first chapter and um, any second now we're gonna get into more interesting R, but I just wanted to say a couple words about um, R on HPC as opposed to doing it on your own um, local computer. And the reason I say that is, well, we're the YCRC, we manage all these HPC resources. We have a lot of people using R on them and how you use R is a little bit different there. So um, it's out of scope of this talk to go into that in any detail, but I just wanted to make you aware that there are some differences. So the first thing is that you may not want to use R Studio on the cluster. Um, you likely will want to um, eventually trans, uh, transition to, to this, to um, writing your R into scripts and submitting them as batch jobs. And, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, don't really worry about it. Um, but uh, in, in general, when you use the clusters, you create these scripts called batch scripts and you submit them as jobs. And that's a, a very different way of operating than by using something as interactive as RStudio. That said, it is possible to use RStudio on the cluster. Um, we have a, a new environment called Open On Demand that gives you a um, uh, uh, basically a, a desktop on uh, the cluster and in that desktop um, you can start up our studio and and work very much the way that you would that I've been showing you and that you'd be used to doing on your local machine and for for development I think that makes sense um, once you are doing real production computing though you're almost certain to want to to do this to um, create our scripts and submit them as batch jobs the other important difference is the installation. So our installations um, typically require that you have administrative privilege, um, which you would not have on our HPC systems. And so you have to do things a little bit differently. Uh, one thing you can do is use our installation of R by using module load. And then it turns out then you can actually do installs of packages on top of that. R, R can figure that out by um, installing into your uh, home directory instead of um, into our installation, our installation. Um, the other thing you can do is, um, there's a very nice system called Conda, uh, which we like a lot, it, that um, makes it easy to do all kinds of installations and um, it can also handle R pretty well. So way beyond the scope today to get into any more detail, I just wanted to point this stuff out and I have a link here to our um, 
our website that has a, a whole page on how to think about R on the cluster. Okay, um, I'm right at time for this section, so I'm gonna skip these challenges. You can come back to them if you wish. didn't work. Uh, try again. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to show you in this section is the most important, simple, basic data structures in R, which are things that you're going to use all the time in any kind of reasonable uh, R program. Because you know, to, to be to be honest, you're not going to spend your time in R um, adding integers together like like I did in the last section. You're going to do much more interesting things. And um, an absolutely canonical use of R is to read in some kind of data file and then do statistics on it and do plots and so forth. So um, it's, it's not an overstatement to say that most R programs involve reading in some sort of table or tables of data. And R is really good at dealing with tabular data and it has uh, built-in data structures that make that really easy. And so that's uh, what I'm gonna talk about now. Okay, so um, Let's look at this code here. So what this is doing is it's um, creating on the fly a, a table of data, um, something called a data frame. So I grab that code, I'm gonna come over here to my, that's not what I wanted to do. Come over here. that in and execute it and um, we can see that it shows up here over in my environment um, what I've done is to create a data frame holding some data about some cats so let's let's print it out so here's what it looks like and it it's pretty intuitive right we look at it um, it's um, three cats, they eat. come over here. This is, I have a file that is the same data. And here it is. So you can see this is a file that contains that same data. Okay, but what I've done here is, um, I didn't actually read the file, I'll do that in a minute. I just on the fly used um, a construction to create a data frame and assign it to cats. So um, that's what it looks like. Now, if a much more normal thing to do would be to actually read this, um, this data file using the function read CSV, point it at this file and assign the resulting data frame to cats. So let me do that. I'll print out cats again, and we have the same thing. So um, again, more natural way to do it, actually just read the file. Read CSV is a function that knows how to read CSV files. And it is an element of a family of functions that all kind of fall under the, uh, the name of read table that can be used to read all kinds of differently formatted uh, files into a data frame. Um, if we were to be really brave and come over here and say read CSV and then press F1, um, we would be nearly overwhelmed with documentation here. <laughs> um, turns out that read CSV is a customization, a sort of particular um, 
a way of using a generic function called read table. And um, this is more than you want to deal with right now, but um, read table can be customized in a huge number of different ways here so that you can figure out a way to read nearly any kind of data file uh, that you might encounter. So this is used for textual data files, things that represent, essentially represent tables of data. So in our case, for classic uh, CSV file, and so um, read CSV uh, does the right thing very simply. So, so that's great. So let's start looking at this cat's um, data structure, this, this data frame. And the, the easiest way, or one of the first things you can do with it is pull out a column. We will see uh, as I go on with this, this section that there are a lot of ways to extract data out of a data frame. So, so let's just step back for a minute. A data frame is just a table. It's a table with rows and columns. Uh, the columns typically have column names. Um, each row has a value for each of the columns. So it's, it's just a classic data table. And a really com a common thing you want to do is I want to look at some particular column of my, of my table. So let's say I want to look at the weight column of my cat's table. This is how I do it. I just say cat's weight and I get out three values. So does that, does that make sense? Let's look at the data again from the, well, let's look at it this way. So cat's weight was 2.1, 5.0, 3.2. If I do cat's weight, Um, I get exactly that column. Um, turns out that's actually a vector. Okay, so it's a vector kind of what we saw before. It's just a series of values um, in order. So it's given me this, this column here. Um, something I want to show you before I forget here is another way in which our studio will give me some help. You see it, oops, it's seeing, sort of watching as I complete and I can go ahead and hit tab and accept what it suggested. So if I do that and, and run the code, I get um, that column. Okay. I can also ask for the coats column, if I can type it. That's coat. Should let. Completion work for me. So here we see that we got the, the values. We got black calico tabby, calico black tabby. Um, it's printed out this sort of strange leading word here, levels, and uh, we'll see what that is in just a minute. But you can see again, it's given me the, the column for um, that value. Now um, we can do Operations on the entire column. So let's add two to cat's weight. And um, you can see that basically added two to each of the elements. So what was 2.1 became 4.1. So um, if you think about it, what's going on here? We, we just did a vector operation, right? The cat's weight is a vector and I can add two to the vector and I get another vector, which is um, with every element increased by two. So another instance of seeing how natural vector arithmetic is in R. Okay, what if we try to do this? Add these two columns together. So that fails. I get a warning message. It says um, I can't add weight and coat together. So um, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, why would we add together something that looks like 2.1 and something that looks like black? That's, that's kind of asking a lot. So 
at this point, we need to sort of, we need to talk about uh, data types a little bit. So the, because the problem here is that, you know, you can see intuitively 2.1 feels like a different type of data than black. And so adding them, what is, what is the poor um, plus sign supposed to do in that case? So let's talk about th what the different data structure, data types are, data types in R. There aren't too many. There are basically five data types and they're shown here. So most numbers are double unless you explicitly ask them to be an integer. Um, there are complex numbers, rarely used, but they exist. Uh, logicals are very common, true and false. And then characters are extremely important. That's basically how you represent strings. So we can ask what is the type of 3.14 and we get back uh, double. Let's just um, take a look at that. If we say type of three, we also get double. And you may recall I, I said a little while back that um, by default, all numbers in the R are doubles, um, unless you specifically ask them to be integers. Um, I can do that, and that makes it an integer. So if you uh, put L at the end of a number specifier, um, that will force it to be an integer. Okay, um, this is how you define a complex number. Basically give it um, an I, et cetera, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> all at the, at, the, at the bottom of any sort of data structure, there's gonna be the elemental uh, bits of data and they're gonna all be one of those five types, no matter what. Um, <clears throat> now, this is an example, I'm gonna open a different file here. And go ahead, let's see, let me grab, this is, the same cats file with another line added. Let me just clean this up. And now if I print out cats, let me actually open uh, that file so you can see it. Over here. So um, we added this line here. So it's, this is kind of strange, I admit. So the weight is, is this bit here. It's, it's 2.3 or 2.4. So I print it out. This is what I get. Um, and if I ask for what the type of this thing is, that's weight. Oddly enough, I get integer, okay? So what happened? It was, before it was a double, and now it suddenly turned into an integer. And um, what happened here is R decided to, to turn that column into something called um, a, a factor. And that was kind of the best it could do. It's, it's sort of gonna treat these things almost as though they're strings now, or, or, or it, it's not gonna treat them as a number anymore because it can't interpret that 2.3 or 2.4 as a number. So it's, it's essentially gonna consider those things categories now rather than numbers. This is something that is pretty easy to bump into and it can be very confusing when it happens. And so now if you were to do this command, um, you're going to get a, an error that says um, you can't use plus on factors because cats.weight has been turned into a factor. We'll see factors in just a little while in more detail. Okay. So um, I'm going to skip now to here. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, a little more depth about um, uh, type coercion and vectors. So uh, 
this is one way to make a vector. And I won't bother to execute this. If we were to print that out, it basically prints out three falses. Um, this is, I admit, kind of weird. Um, but basically what's happening here is it's creating an empty vector of length three, and the default uh, basic data type of a vector is Boolean or logical. And so um, that's, what, that's what you're going to get. Um, you could create a different vector of character type by doing this. OK. Um, if we went back to our original cat's data frame um, and looked at it before, let's see, let me fix that, actually. I will go back here and do this. And now if we look at cats, we have this original, we, we haven't screwed up this value here. We still have the 3.2. Um, so now if we do this command, um, we can see that what we get is a vector of, uh, of numbers. And um, I'll just point out here, this STR, this can be a little confusing. This is one of many, maybe call them false cognates from other languages. Uh, this STR means structure in R, and it's basically a, a nice function that inspects this thing and, and tells you something useful about it. So what it's telling me here is that it's um, this uh, vector of numbers. Another way to make vectors, and this, this is probably a more common way to make them, to make vectors, is by using um, the combine function, which is abbreviated, confusingly enough, as C. You will see this all the time in R, uh, uh, this C function that has a bunch of stuff in it. And you can think of it as gluing the stuff together into a vector. So if we do that, That's right. Um, we get a vector of three numbers. So far, so good. Now let's let's look at this. What happens if we do this? I don't have to actually do the assignment. I can just run the um, expression itself and see what we get. So look what happened here. Let me clean this up. Um, we gave it what to us looks like an integer, an integer, and a string, or a character vector. And what we got back was nothing but these strings. And uh, what happened here is that R insists that all elements of, of a vector be the same type. And if um, it's presented with a collection of things to turn into a vector that aren't the same type, it's, it's going to find the lowest common denominator, essentially, um, and convert everything into that. And it has a very well-specified hierarchy of different uh, of the types um, in order to define the lowest common denominator. And, and you can see why this kind of makes sense, right? It's, it's pretty easy to convert any number into a string it's, it's not so easy to convert any string into a number. And so um, you can see why strings are lower, uh, um, lower on the hierarchy. So similarly, if you were to try to mash um, a string and a Boolean value together, um, what it's going to do in that case also is, is convert everything to a string. So it's, again, it's pretty easy to turn true into um, a, a string, but not so easy to go the other way, and so forth. So I like this here. This is actually the cleanest representation of this that I've seen. Um, basically, um, if you combine any collection of these different types together, um, they're all going to be converted into uh, the lowest common denominator uh, along this hierarchy. We're ending with character. So if, if nothing else can work, um, we'll do will do character. So um, you might say, well, how does that work? Well, true and false get converted into 0 and 1. Um, any integers can be converted into a floating point. Um, 
floating points can be converted into simple um, complex without a, uh, an I component and so forth. So that pretty much makes sense. So you just have to be a little bit careful though when you when this coercion happens. So um, it's going to do what it's going to do, and if you don't like it, there are ways these as functions that you can try to force it to do something else. And basically, what will happen is if if it can do it, it will. So in this case, it wasn't too hard for as numeric to take this and uh, turn it into that, right? That makes sense. Um, but if you, um, and for instance, you can take this and course it into a logical where uh, zero gets converted to a false and any non-zero value gets converted to true. But um, it's possible to um, try to do things that won't work. And if you do that, you're gonna get um, values that don't make sense. Hoping to see an example of that here. Um, but you get the basic idea. Okay. Um, another thing that the combined function will do is to um, glue things onto an existing vendor, a vector. So you can extend a vector. So here we started out with a vector of just two things, and we can take um, C of that existing vector and slap on a new element, and then we just get um, a longer vector. So that's uh, very straightforward, a very common thing to do in R. We've already seen this. We can create a series using the colon operator. There's a, a function that does essentially the same thing, seek. Uh, you give it a number and it'll give you uh, up to that number, just like this. Um, seek is smarter than that. You can give seek a, a begin, an end, and a by. And um, this is a very common thing to want to do. For instance, if you're generating plots, you might use this to generate the x coordinates of your plot. So you can get a whole bunch of, of um, individual numbers at the desired spacing. Uh, a couple of very useful functions on all kinds of things um, head and tail. Head and tail work on vectors. They also work on data frames. Uh, you can do length on a, a vector and get the length of it and so forth. So a bunch of, of utility functions that are very useful on vectors. Um, kind of surprising thing you can do with a vector is name its elements. I have to say this, this combines a lot of very confusing and interesting R stuff if you're used to other languages. So what's going on here? So we created this vector of um, five through eight. So we can do that. That's not what I wanted to do. And um, just print it out. At five through eight. So far, so good. It's nothing new. But we can do this very weird thing here where we assign names to each of the elements of my vector. So this is a vector of names. And we're going to assign that to what looks like a function call on my example. And now, if I do names, uh, my example, sorry. Um, what did I do wrong? Let's see. Um, look what it printed out this time. It actually prints out two lines with uh, the names above the, uh, the values. And that's going to be important in a minute when we look at how you can extract values from, uh, from a vector. Okay. 
that was a lot there pretty quickly. I'm going to take a second just to pause and see if anybody wants to ask a question. Okay. So let's return to our cat's data structure and make sure that I have that uh, initialized here. If I don't, I'll redo it. Yeah, okay, so that looks right. Here's our cat's data st structure. Um, so data frames, each column of a data frame, remember, recall, just stepping back for a minute, a data frame represents the table of data and each row is an observation and each column is some feature of that op observ observation, typically. And so um, a column is, say in this case, all the weights of the cats. And um, in terms of R, it's represented as a vector. What does that mean? It means all the, the values in that column have to be the same type, among other things. And so we can run structure on one of those columns, say the weight column, and see what it is like this. Um, if we run structure on cats like string, um, we can see that it's a bunch of Boolean values. So let's do that. That's like string. Um, sorry. You can see that um, if we just do it that way, we get out numbers zero, one, zero, and one, but if we do str, um, that's interesting. I did something wrong there. So um, <clears throat> I'm not sure why, but um, in here in the presentation, they're represented as Booleans. Um, and we talked a little bit about how integers can go, uh, can be interpreted as, uh, as Booleans, or Booleans can be interpreted as integers. But um, what we want to talk about now is this third column, coat, which is this thing called a factor. And I've uh, mentioned that a couple times already. So what's going on here with these factors? Um, factors you can think of as categorical data. So when, when our studio saves these values, um, cats, so, um, although it looks to us like what it's saving is strings, calico, black, and tabby, Internally, what it's doing is converting those into integers and storing the integers. So it's basically storing all the different categories that it saw. And that, that's a, a vastly more efficient way to store it, and, a, and it makes it much more efficient to operate on. And, and that's called a factor. So how do factors come to be? Well, you can explicitly make a factor like this. You can, so what we've done here is create um, a vector of characters. So, so far, no. Um, there is no factor yet. All we've got is these, these strings here, tabby, tortoiseshell, tortoiseshell, black, tabby, etc. Um, but we can turn it into a factor by using the factor function on it. Let me just do the first part here. Now, if we look at categories, um, it's changed. It's, it's no longer just a bunch of strings. It's these levels. So it's converted those strings into integers um, and stored them that way. So instead of storing tabby, tortoiseshell, tortoiseshell, black, uh, and whatever the last one was, guess tortoiseshell it's all it's storing is these numbers and it's also 
internally keeping a mapping back to the names. So what's actually in, in our factor is just uh, the integer numbers. That's what we see here. Okay, and so the thing about a, a, a when you load data into a data frame, uh, it is going to, generally speaking, automatically convert <clears throat> columns that are strings uh, into factors. And that's what happened when we loaded in that cat's data frame, is it automatically um, turned the uh, coat column into a data frame. Now, um, normally, <clears throat> if you don't do anything special, um, the, the number that gets assigned to a particular um, word, a particular string, is, um, you could think of it as arbitrary, it's, it's really actually done alphabetically, but there are certain times when you care, for instance, that um, control might be one and case might be two or something. And um, this is showing that there is a way for you to force the assignment of what integer gets assigned to what, um, what category. Okay, we're getting there. Um, the next thing I want to show you is um, a simple data structure is the list data structure. Um, lists are uh, different than vectors in a number of ways. The most important way is that they're, um, they're more flexible. They don't require that <clears throat> all of the elements of the list be the same type. So for example here, it's perfectly okay to construct a list that combines one and a and true and a, and a complex number and there won't be any of that coercion that we saw before. It's, it's perfectly happy to let those things live as uh, their own type. Um, so it's very flexible in that sense. Um, you can um, construct a list out of, here we're constructing a list out of the string numbers and um, a vector and a Boolean value. And we're also on the fly here um, giving the list elements names. So this is a list of three elements. Um, the first element is the string numbers, which um, has the name title. The second element is a vector, uh, has the name numbers and so forth. So it turns out that um, a data frame is actually a list. And that's, um, it's a list where each of the Elements of the list is a vector, a named vector. The name of the vector is the name of the column. And, um, and so oddly enough, and this is why this happens, if you ask what type cats is here, uh, the answer you get is list. Okay, let me clean this, clean this up again. So a data frame, and I think this is really helpful. I spent quite a long time being a little bit vague. You can get surprisingly far being a little bit vague on what a data frame really is under the covers. But I think it's helpful to know. Under the covers, um, it's a list that glues together a bunch of vectors. Um, and uh, each vector represents one column. And then those columns are, are glued together by, by a list and the columns are given names through the names of the list. Okay. So I'm gonna, um, okay. So this part, this is probably the most important part of the second section in many ways. So I'm gonna try to do it as, um, as clearly as possible. So once you have this cats, any data frame, in our case, we've got this cat's data frame. Um, you're, you're going to want to pull out some pieces of this thing and do things to them. That's absolutely classic. It's basically what a lot of data frame work consists of. We've already seen one example of that, which is to pull out a column by using a name, okay? So you say the name of the data frame, dollar sign, 
name of column. And that um, essentially gives you that vector um, of that column. Okay, so that's, that's one way to extract stuff. But what if you wanted something else? What if you wanted, uh, for instance, a row of uh, a data frame rather than a column? We want row three, say, of the um, data frame. So what happens if we do this? Well, we didn't get what we, what we hoped, right? What we got here was a column. Let's, let's make that a little clearer if I ask for one. So um, an additional way to pull a um, column out of a data frame is to give its uh, position within you know, the, the, the index of the column using single brackets. So these um, cats1 and cats coat are essentially identical. They're just two different ways of getting the same thing. I would say cat's code is better because it doesn't require that I understand the order of the columns, but in this case, they both work. But what if I want the row? So this is how you pull out a single row of a data frame. And um, why does this make sense? What, what's going on here? Think of cats in a different way now. Think of it as a collection of, uh, think of it as a matrix even that has rows and columns. And so what I've done here is I've said, give me row one, and I didn't say anything about what column I wanted. So I'm gonna get row one, all the columns. And so I get row one. If I want row three, I can say that, and I get row three. Okay. Um, believe it or not, I can also do this, which will give me um, column one and all the rows. So this is really equ it's equivalent to this. Sorry, I keep doing that. Cat is um, not what I want. I want cats. Okay. I can pull out a single element by specifying both row and column. Okay. And Rob, I'm gonna cover some of this in the um, accessing data Great. portion. That's, that's well. good. Okay, I'll, then I'll, um, I'll end this part now. It's, um, I think it's just, it's worth keeping in mind that um, you can access these data frames in a number of ways and it will help you if you, get as clear as possible on, on what those different ways are. So that's really an important learning process in R. Okay. Um, the last thing in this section is matrices. Um, a matrix is, <clears throat> it, it's really pretty intuitive. It feels like a matrix, like an array in a lot, two dimensional array, for example, in a lot of other languages. Um, it differs from a data frame in that all the elements of the matrix have to be the same type. So typically in a matrix, I mean, the, the classic matrix would e either be a matrix of integers or um, and, and, um, a matrix of doubles. And so, um, you know, for sort of numeric programming, uh, that's when you would tend to use a matrix. And here's an example of how to create a matrix. So here um, we, say we want our matrix to be filled with zero, we want it to have six columns and, and three rows. There are tons of ways of creating matrices and shaping them and um, uh, transforming them. Um, I just really wanted you to know that they exist. You don't have to do everything in a, in a data frame uh, for, for um, truly matrix operations. Matrices are gonna be much more efficient. Um, you, um, can pull things out of a matrix in a, in a pretty straightforward way, um, similar to what I showed you with uh, data frames. So you give the rows and the columns that you want, and it'll give you essentially a, a sub matrix of uh, the original matrix. Okay, I think I am going to end there with uh, section two and hand things over to Ben. Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
I am going to, I think, give everyone like a three to five minute break, sort of get up, stretch your legs, take some deep breaths, and then we'll resume at, by my clock, 2.30. Uh, and we'll start off with the next section, the next episode called Exploring Data Frames. And during the break, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or uh, click the raise hand button if you prefer to say them out loud. I'm also going to steal the screen back. Let's see. There we go. All right, everyone.
I am ready to start again. If if you could do me a favor and just type something in the chat to let us know you're still there, alive and watching us, would really appreciate it. Uh, if this screen is occupying your entire computer, you sort of move your mouse to the very top, uh, and then there's a option at the far right that says more, and you can click on the chat window there. All right, excellent. People are here and watching. Good to know. So uh, Rob gave us a good sort of overview of R and specifically how to use R with RStudio and, and all the basic building blocks that you can use in your R programs. And what I want to do to start off is talk about how to take probably one of the more complex but also more useful data structures, the data frame, and, and sort of manipulate it, take things away, paste things back together, and then understand how factors work with those as well. Because oftentimes I find that factors are kind of the, the most uh, confusing pieces of data to incorporate into a data frame. But to start, I just want to show how you can add a column or a row to your data frames. So uh, you recall our cats data frame that has the coat, weight, and likes string columns. Say I wanted to add age to this data frame uh, so that I'm saying my calico cat is two, my black cat is three, and my tabby is five. I could add this with the function C bind for bind the columns together. And so calling C bind, giving it a, uh, a data frame and then an additional vector to, to slap on there. It will, it, R is smart enough to know that, you know, this, this first thing that, that I'm handing to C bind is a data frame. And the next thing is if it's a vector, it'll use the name of that vector, the variable name, as the column name for that new, uh, new column in the data frame. So that's kind of neat. Something to keep in mind, though, when you use CBind, is that your data have to be the right dimensions. So here in this example, if I add an extra age to my age vector, see this 12, R will throw an error. It won't continue. It'll stop and say, you asked me to do something I don't know how to do, which is kind of strange for R. Usually it'll do its best to figure out what you wanted and soldier on. But in this case, it insists that when you try and add a column to your data frame, it must be the same length as the number of rows of your data frame. So you see, uh, these arguments imply a differing number of rows. The data frame has three, but you handed me something with four. And it's the same with a, a new column that is too short. So here I'm defining the age vector to just have two values. And again, it'll complain the same way, but it'll complain about the thing that I wanted to add being too short. You can ask for the number of rows in your data frame with the in row function. You see here for cats, it is the expected value of three. Let me scroll back to, you see I have three rows in this data frame. And to get a similar value for uh, vectors, you would use the function length. And so if I ask for length of age, the most recent version of age that I defined is here, which just has two values. So that would give me the answer of two. And so if you ever wanted to check, you would want to make sure, and what R is doing underneath the covers here, among other things, when, it, when you call CBind, is to make sure that the number of row uh, of cats is equal to the length of 
age. And so just again here, I'm defining uh, an age column with these three variables and binding them together. And I can sort of replace the old cats with a new one that has the new column all in one line with, with this assignment here. The next thing you might want to do is add rows. So to add a row to your data frame, you will want to add a list that is then combined with your data frame with the rbind function. So here I'm defining a new row where each of the elements of a list is one of the columns or an observation of each of the columns. So I'm adding a new tortoiseshell cat that is, uh, shoot, <laughs> uh, it's 3.3 of weight. It uh, does like string and is nine years old. And so once I've defined this new row, I can add it to my cat's, uh, cat's data frame with the rbind function, but wait you might see an error like this where it says warning in and then a bunch of strange stuff. And then the important thing to notice is it says invalid factor. And the reason for this is that when this uh, three row data frame was created, R defined coat as a factor for me. and there was no tortoise shell uh, level in this factor. So um, I'm gonna get an error and this new row will have an A for the coat, which is not what I would want this to be. So I'm gonna sort of take a sidestep away from the uh, data frames and talk a little bit more deeply about factors. So as Rob said, factors are a really efficient way of storing categorical data. You can give yourself the human names for each of the factors, but what R does underneath is stores them as uh, these integers, which are also called levels. And so if I look at the cat's coat column and call the function levels on it, it'll show me there are three levels and this is the order. There's the first one is called black, the second one is called calico, and the third one called tabby. And if I actually wanted to add my list that I defined earlier, before I do that, I have to add a level to my factors. And so to do this, um, is do this strange, ask for the levels from the coat column, and then combine the levels from the coat column and tortoise shell. And what that will do is, even though I haven't added a row yet, it'll tell R that it's okay for me to add new data to that uh, factor column that includes a level called tortoise shell. So I have to tell it about tortoise shell, the level, before I add any new data about uh, that factor. And so you'll notice also, if you ask for the structure of cats, um, you can get the factor with four levels. Uh, you know, it'll chop it off here, but then it'll also um, give you the number representations uh, afterwards. If for some reason you wanted to do away with your factors, for example, if you wanted to um, add a bunch of new factors without having to do them uh, as I just showed you, you can convert or, or cast the coat column just back to a simple string or character variable type with a, a statement like this. And then if I ask for the structure of cats, you'll see that now 
all our knows is that these are just a collection of characters for each of the rows. Uh, let's see. Time. Time is on our side. So say I wanted to add a new column that is the human age, or oftentimes people will um, dilate cat and dog ages in order to sort of approximate how near they are to a human end of life by uh, multiplying it by some number. So here, say my fudge factor is seven. So I, I wanna take the age column and multiply it by seven and add it as a new column called uh, human age. So what I could do is create this new vector here. And because uh, maybe it's not fair to actually treat these as uh, quantitative numbers because I sort of made this up. Maybe I just want to know who is roughly the same uh, class of age uh, that I defined as human age. I can convert that to a factor um, thusly. So I can just take that column I'm sorry, take that vector and convert it. And then I'll see that these ages, you know, I have four unique kinds of age and uh, five observations there. Any questions so far? I'm gonna pause for just a moment to let people's fingers catch up with their brains. Okay, cool, I will continue then. So once you've added rows, you might also want to be able to remove rows. This is a very common thing you might wanna do. Um, say you had some data that you would want to remove for a certain analysis, maybe because uh, your function doesn't understand how to deal with missing data. Uh, R, when indexing things, allows us this sort of interesting syntax where I can, um, it looks like I'm, I'm talking about the, the negative fourth uh, index of this data frame. But what I'm actually telling R is I wanna see this data frame except for the fourth row. So this is sort of like a, a, an inverse operation. I'm saying everything but the fourth thing. And I can also give a, a vector here, I can combine negative four and negative five and remove both of those rows with syntax like this. R also gives us a, a nice little function called na.omit, which will drop all rows with na values in any of the columns. So this would achieve the same end result in the specific case as uh, this line, but maybe someone else reading my code would understand this, the use of this function a little bit better than some specific negative numbers. And so far all I've been doing is just printing out the results of these uh, ways of accessing these data and what I want, say, if I wanted to save that in order to continue on with my analysis, what I would do is, is call that function and then just reassign it back to the original variable to make those changes permanent. After removing rows, maybe you would also want to remove columns. So the same um, access syntax that 
works for rows works for columns and the same negative number indexing works as well so say I just wanted to remove the fourth column I could type uh, this with the square brackets and I would remove column four and so you can see printing out here I now only have three columns for cats and again as Rob showed before by leaving an empty space in front of that comma I'm indicating to R that I want to keep all of the rows I just want to remove that one column uh, you can also use this sort of strange operator called percent sign in percent sign. Uh, what the in operator does is it goes through each element of its left argument and asks, does that element occur in its right argument? And so you might encounter this sort of syntax uh, and I tell you what, let's, oh, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. So I'm asking for the names of cats, which is the columns. Do any of those match the, the string age? That will return the index of uh, any columns in cats called age. And what I can do is store that in a variable. And then um, I can also use this the, the bang operator, the not, to say I want all of the all of the rows, but not the column that I called drop, which is would be four in this case. Questions about adding rows and columns, removing rows and columns, and accessing those in a data frame. So we all know our C bind and R binds now. Very cool. The other thing that you can do with R bind is actually glue together data frames. So remember that Rob told us data frames are, uh, you know, columns are vectors and rows are lists. So if we wanted to paste together two data frames where their columns match, we would be pasting together rows. So we would use the R bind function. So we could just double the size of our cats uh, data frame by duplicating it by calling R bind on cats and cats. So you can see I have now just one copy of the data frame on top of itself. Uh, something you'll notice is R will do this strange row numbering where it'll keep the original row name but add a one to it so that you can kind of see what the last one was but it has to be unique too and so to, to just renumber the the rows to make your life easier you can use this um, kind of obtuse syntax where you set the row names to null the special value in R and then it will automatically renumber the rows for you. So if you then ask to view your cats data frame, where I now it's actually cats on cats, uh, you'll see that these numbers are consecutive and make a bit more sense. Uh, I'm gonna skip that real quick. So if I wanna get to a more interesting example than our cat's data frame. And what, what that looks like is this gap minder data. So just hop over to my 
our studio over here. Um, I hope this is big enough for everyone. Let me just make it one kick bigger. That looks okay. So I can uh, use the read.csv function that, that Rob talked about earlier to, to read in this CSV file that has some data that I'm interested in. One thing that I didn't know when I started using R that turns out to be super useful in some cases, you can um, use the download.file function if you wanted to, to get a cache of some some uh, CSV file or other file that you just can get from the internet. Uh, and then also specify the name of it as, as where you would like to save it. But, but more interestingly, you can sort of read things on the fly. So say you had like a, a file hosted on some, some lab web server or a colleague had put it sort of publicly on the internet or there's a data source that you have that's um, somewhere else you can read it directly from a URL and, and R sort of knows how to go and get that for you. So that's, that's pretty neat. But let's take a look at this Gapminder uh, data set. So if I run this, this is like a number of rows that are not fun to look at on a single screen. So we just have to to be able to access this data frame and look at just the pieces that we want in various ways. But you see that there's um, a column called country and it's a factor. So there's 142 countries probably described in this data frame. It has year column. So each of those uh, rows may also have a year and that those are defined as integers. Population, so number of people, what continent it is on, the life expectancy in years, and then the GDP, GDP per capita. And so you can imagine some uh, statistics, some simple statistics you might want to do on a data frame of this uh, form. And actually, also run um, the summary function on these data. And for everything, it's a bit much to look at on one screen. But just to give you a flavor, this will, you know, so some of the more meaningful columns where this is interesting is, uh, you know, the the country's summary is what sort of takes over most of the output on the page. But what's kind of neat is you can get some quick summary statistics of each of the columns in your data frame with this summary function. And so I can see the minimum and maximum and, and quartiles and such for each of the more quantitative uh, columns in my data frame. And then, uh, you know, the typo function still works. I can look at and verify that each of those variable types reported in my structure function are true by calling type of on each of the columns. And so what happens if I call, well, you can see right here, but if I call length on a data frame, it gives me back the number six. So why does it tell me six here? Does anyone want to say in the chat why they think it might be six? Because I have, I have a lot of rows. I have a hundred and, sorry, a thousand, over a thousand rows. Returning six instead. Right. 
So it's it's because there are six columns, and because the length function only returns one number, they just decided that uh, length is the length of the number of columns for the data frame. Uh, and you'll also see that if you run type of on the data frame, you'll get back the uh, variable type list, which means that what R actually sees your data frame as is a list of length six, where each of those columns is um, a single object. And again, if you wanted to see the number of rows in your data frame, you can call in row and the in call function is another way of seeing its length. And I find that in call is a bit easier to remember because uh, its name tells me what I actually want to know is the number of columns in this data frame. You can also get the dimensions, both the number of rows and columns at once with the function dim. So let's, let's try that one. So see, it gives me both. You can also just get, <coughs> excuse me, a list of the names of your columns. This is also a nice way if you ever wanted to rename the, one of your columns, you can do so by reassigning a list to call names. And the head and tail functions work nicely on large data frames. So it lets you peek into them without overwhelming your, your terminal or wherever you're viewing your, your data on. So you see we can go, we go from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, and it looks like these data are sorted first by country. So I can see that just by, by looking at the, the beginning and the end of the, of the data frame. So how do you imagine we might check sort of the middle of our data frame? One way to do this is with tail, and then tail also accepts an option called n for just number of rows. So, oops, I smack that. So I can get more rows. Uh, what I could also do, I wonder if this works. Um, so what, it's 1,700. Can I do this? Yeah. So I could also ask for the, the first, um, what is it by default, six lines of the last 500 lines by asking for head to be called on the results of tail. So I can just look in the middle here and see that these index lines are from Peru. You can sort of peek into your data with a combination of head and tail here. All right, I'm happy with that. So um, this key points box is almost uh, a, a cheat sheet for probably the, all the most common ways in which you would interact with and manipulate your your data tables, or your, sorry, your data frames, um, with the exception of remembering that that square bracket syntax for accessing data is your 
rows and columns. So first rows, comma, columns. Does anyone have any questions about the portions of this episode exploring data frames? If not, I will move on to the next. Okay, I'm gonna talk about how to subset data. So we talked a little bit just about um, explicitly taking columns and rows on and off of the data frame. But R gives you a lot, a lot of ways. Uh, what did I say up here? Six different ways you can subset uh, any kind of object, and there are three different subsetting operators. So I'm going to go over those in this section. And to start, take a an example where we've named uh, a vector. So here is a vector with some some values, some number values, and each of them has a name, A, B, C, D, and E. So I can just this and there we go so now you see i have a named numeric vector that's five long and there are its values and if i type oops if i type x you can see i get the same result as here so I can get the first thing with x square brackets one. Recall that R, unlike a lot of other programming languages, starts counting at one, not zero. So if, if x square brackets one will give me the very first value, and four will give me the fourth. I can also ask for multiple and uh, non-contiguous values with the combine. So I can, I can pass in a, a vector of indices and retrieve just those. So in this example, I'm asking for the first and the third value. Just to prove to you that also works. And just like Rob showed, with this colon syntax, I can generate a, uh, a vector of numbers from one to four with the colon operator and get to those things as well. So that's a nice way of um, getting consecutive values out of a data, uh, out of a, a data structure. And uh, so yeah, just reminding us that this is the same. Uh, for various reasons, you might find it useful to ask for the same value more than one time. If you wanted to duplicate it, you can do so as well. You can ask for the first value twice. And you can also <laughs> ask for a value that doesn't exist and R will happily just return an A. So it won't complain that that value doesn't exist. It'll just say, um, I don't know what you mean. You'll also notice that if we try an index to zero, it'll just tell me um, information about that variable. So just another example, you can use this negative number indexing to remove elements of your data. So here I'm saying, I want everything from X, but the second element. So you can see I've removed that. Uh, I can 
ask for not multiple indices. So I want not the first and not the fifth, like so. It sort of harkens back to the order of operations example, but why would this happen? That's because what I'm actually trying to index on looks like this. And so these are not valid indices. So what I would actually want to do if I wanted to just remove everything from the first to the third element is ask for R to, to make negative this range of numbers and you'll see that I'm indexing on these values. And so, so far all I've been doing is printing the results back to my screen, but if I actually wanted to make one of those changes permanent, I would do this very standard uh, access and then reassign so that X now just has removed the fourth, um, the fourth thing. The thing you need to be careful about when you do this though is it'll change the numbering. So the new uh, fourth thing will actually be this, this value here that's now labeled E. So watch out. Uh, we've gone over that. Let's see. With, so one of the nice things about naming your vectors is you can access them also on their names. So here's just another way to, to name a vector. Instead of with two lines, you can do it in one. So we can just reset that. And I can access the same way I was accessing their indices numerically. I can access their names by specifying um, exactly their names as characters or as character variables. So here I'm asking for A and C. So that's kind of nice. If, if I go through the trouble of naming something I can talk about it as names. Uh, another way that you can subset data is with uh, logical vectors. These are sometimes called masks. Um, I will oftentimes do this, and, and this is really powerful if you want to subset your data based on some test. And so, you can sort of manually construct a, uh, a logical operator just by typing out your logical values. And so see here I wanted, let's see, one, two, I want the third and the fifth. And here it'll output just C and E. But a more interesting case would be I want all the values from X where they are greater than seven. And so I get that, but if I run just this, what happens is it's generating that uh, logical vector for me. And so, you know, if the reverse would give me the reverse and I can get the values represented by those indices by asking for uh, are to use that as an index. So that's pretty nice. And it's, I, I find it to, you know, once you can, um, can read it, I find it to be, you know, relatively elegant way of, of asking for uh, good slices of data. And this isn't a great example. Let's see, how about if I try this? So I can also ask for um, an equality test in indexing. 
Uh, if you want to combine, let's see if this is, yeah. So if you want to combine your tests, you'll want to use the, what are often called the logical operators. So this is the single ampersand for and and the single pipe symbol for or. And those will uh, run the logic and combine your um, logical vectors the way that you would expect. You'll see these double ones. Those are for um, a different part of these lessons. I'll talk about them in a bit, I believe. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to look at all of the portions of x that are less than seven but greater than four, I could construct something like this where I am combining with logical and these two uh, logical vectors and getting the result and then asking for that as an index. And so again, I find this to be pretty readable and it's sort of uh, a relatively straightforward way to do a pretty advanced operation that would take um, quite a bit of programming if you were doing it in something like C. Uh, sort of a pitfall of having named vectors is you, R will allow you to name different portions of your vector the same thing. And accessing those named values with a name will only return the first value. And so a way around that to guarantee that you're getting all of the things with that name would be um, creating this logical vector asking for all of the indices where the names of x equals um, the character a and then you would actually get all three values. The same way that we can index numbers is not a way that R allows us to index names. So you'll see here, if I try and index negative A, um, it'll give me this weird error about invalid argument to, to an operator. And so the better way to do this is with the not equals operator. So I could ask for X where all of its names are not equal to A and do that. Um, if I wanted to skip A and C, maybe I could do this, where X e where I want all of the indices of names where it's not equal to A or C. And I get this weird error that says longer object length is not a multiple of shorter object length. But then it does actually output something. And so what's actually happening here? Well, it turns out that R does this recycling thing where if I don't tell it to do anything differently, let me just run this. You'll see that same error, but it outputs this false, true, 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 true. What ends up happening is R recycles these such that it looks for is this portion of the um, the thing I'm actually, so this is the names of my vector. And I'll say, okay, I'm gonna test against these two. And um, because I'm, this is a logical not, A and A are equal, so this is false. B and C are not equal, so this is true. And then it'll try and recycle them. So it'll take the thing I was comparing to and, and move it over here and it'll compare it to the next two. And so A and C are not equal, so this is true. 
and D and C are not equal, so this is true, and so on. And the thing it's complaining about is it had like a, a remainder here. So it tried to compare, it tried to recycle this again, but it only got the first element and didn't get to use the second element here. But it said, I was still able to finish, so here you go. Here's your logical vector. Uh, and it's just sort of another one of the lovely quirks in R. It just sometimes recycles things. So that's why you get you would get this set of values and an error if you do that. And so if you if, we, if what you actually wanted to do was uh, what I described before, here would be a way to do it. You could ask for uh, all of the indices where um, the names of this left thing are at least one of the names of the things in the right thing. And then negate it with a with a not here with the exclamation point, and so I can sort of break that down for you. So this is the opposite of what I want. This is the the A and the C indices as true, and so if I negate that and use it as an index, I can actually get the data that I was after. And so if I wanted, say, from our Gapminder data set, just countries in Southeast Asia, I can. Take a look at countries. So I just here got a unique list of all the countries from the Gapminder data set by asking for, um, so if you recall, the country is our factors. So to make it easier to compare, I am casting that as a character or to turning it into strings and then calling the function unique so that I don't get one element in my, uh, in my list or vector of, for each of the rows, I just want a, a, a unique list of all the countries from this data set. So this is a way to just get the countries, and I'm storing that in a vector called countries. And so because of what we saw with regards to the way that R recycles things when I try and compare two vectors, I can't just ask for the uh, double equals comparison between those two vectors. The, um, <laughs> The long and hard way would be to do something like this, where I ask for all of the indices from countries where Myanmar is true, and Thailand is true, and Cambodia is true, and Vietnam and Laos is true, and then uh, ask for the logical or of all of those. Or I could actually just say, um, I could use the, the, the in operator to do the same thing. And so you'll find that oftentimes there is a relatively simple and straightforward way of expressing a function or, or something you want to do in R. And then there's also a really long, tedious way to do it. And so if you find that what you're trying to do is long and tedious, it might be time to take a step back or consult um, Google or, or get in touch with us and say, I, I think I'm doing this the long, hard way. And maybe there's a more straightforward or elegant way to do this. Uh, R has several functions for um, what was the 
the NAO mit is an example of this that I brought up earlier, but it has several functions for asking about um, missing or infinity data in your data sets. And so you can slice and, and dice and, and access data that are or are not those types with those the functions here. Let me do it on time. Okay, cool. Uh, factors, you can subset in a couple of neat ways. You can ask for, so let me just do this real quick. Clear that out. So here I have my F factor where I have two A's, two C's, one B and one D with four levels, A, B, C, and D. And I can ask my factor for all of the uh, uh, values where they're equal to A. And here, I'm actually comparing it to a character, but R is smart enough to know that what I'm talking about is the character stored in my levels. So you can see that, that returns what I was interested in. It has, I have two values and um, it still reports that there are four levels. But again, if I want to compare f to multiple values, I need to use the in operator, like so. So here I'm returning all the values with b or c. And because these factors kind of look like a, uh, a vector. I can index them as such. So I can just get the first three with a numeric indexing, and I can also use the negative numbers. So say here, I'm just removing the third element. Questions about that so far? Okay, I'll move on to matrix subsetting. So matrices, we can, and I, I believe Rob began to cover this as well. We can use the square bracket notation to subset matrices in some interesting ways. Uh, I'm just gonna make a matrix with a bunch of numbers in it for fun. I'm using the, um, normal function to just sample. So I have some interesting numbers to look at. So here's what my matrix M is. It has four columns and six rows and has a bunch of interesting uh, samples from normal distribution in it. And here what I can do is, is show off several kinds of, or two kinds of indexing at once. Here I'm asking for the third and the fourth rows, but I want the third column first and then the first column. And so you'll see that, let's see, uh, third, but I'm getting, so I got this value here, because it is the third row, uh, third column, and then the first column, third row here. And so you can index both with the consecutive and non-consecutive uh, ways with the matrices, matrices and combine them as pleases you. Again, you can omit one or the other of your uh, indices to just say, I want all of it. So here I'm asking for all rows, third and fourth columns. You'll notice that when I, the result that is returned is actually automatically renumbered for me. So keep that in mind if you are um, recreating your matrices, they are always going to be consecutively numbered in row and column. 
Uh, I can also ask just for a single row. Uh, when I get something that is one dimensional, R will, or I'm sorry, is either one row or one column, one dimensional, R will automatically convert the result into a vector, which may or may not be the thing that you want. And so, um, if you want to keep it looking as much like a matrix as possible, you can add this option to the square brackets function called uh, drop equals false, which just means you're not allowed to drop me down into a vector, keep me as a matrix at all costs. And so you see, this is a, a one dimensional, I'm sorry, a, yeah, a one dimensional matrix. One thing that is different about matrices to vectors is if I try and access something that doesn't exist, instead of giving me uh, a list of NAs, it'll actually complain that my subscript is out of bounds. So R is a little bit stricter about accessing data in matrices. Uh, and then uh, the secret about matrices is underneath they're actually just vectors. And so you can ask for the fifth thing in your matrix just with a single value as well. Uh, and you can also, because they are underneath um, vectors, you can initialize matrices with a single one dimensional object and then tell it how what dimensions are there actually are with the in row and end call options to the matrix function. So you'll you'll recall that this would just give me a vector from one to six. But if I call the matrix function on it, and tell the matrix that I have two rows and three columns. I can create a matrix like this. And if I omit, uh, if I omit the by row equals true, instead of wrapping one, two, three, four, five, six across rows, it will wrap them across columns. Time for this. So lists you can subset with three, uh, what I guess, yeah, are technically functions. The single bracket on a list will return um, a sub, a portion of the original list. So here's actually, let me do this. Here's my list. And you'll notice that it's sort of heterogeneous. I have a single thing. I have a list, an element in this list as a vector. And I actually have also have an entire data frame stored in this list. And so you see here, I named this first thing A, the second thing B and this third thing, uh, data. And so if I just wanna see the first element of X list, I can ask for it this way. You'll notice though that it returns uh, a list itself. If I do type, type of, it's returning a list even though this looks like a character. And shoot, okay, good. Uh, I can also get, just as with the other examples, I can ask for the first two elements of this list with one colon two. Um, 
if I want to actually unwrap that list and get the value stored inside it, I have to use these kind of confusing double brackets. Let's see if I do this. I'm actually getting the value stored there. So the result of this is a vector of type character rather than a list of length one with a single element in it that is a vector of type character. Because that only has one value, I can't do this. I also can't skip elements with the double brackets. Uh, you'll see the dollar sign as another way for extracting elements from a list by name. So the, the third thing that I defined Actually, if we just go back here, uh, you'll remember that I called this last thing just the beginning of this built-in data set in, in R that's used in a lot of examples called Iris. I called it data. So in my list, I can uh, access the different named portions of it with a dollar sign, and R Studio is helpful enough to know the, the different names of this list already. And so I can sort of scroll through and ask for uh, list dollar sign data. And it'll show me that portion. Let's scroll back down. Uh, so if I wanted to extract the number two from this list, which is a portion of B, how could I do so? Uh, you see, you can combine these, and this is probably the way I would do it. You can combine the accession here and recall that uh, dollar sign B will return this, uh, this vector and then Two will return the second portion of that. And so I can chain these um, ways of accessing data and in doing so, sort of drill up and down more complex data structures, uh, which you'll probably run into pretty quickly if you start using any of the more advanced R packages that are floating out there. Uh, doo -doo. Not gonna do linear models right now. And the last um, ways in which we can access data I want to go over is with data frames. So again, Rob alluded to this, but I can here, because population is the third column, I believe. Call names. I do too many things at once. Gap minder. So you'll see this is the third. So if I index gap minder square bracket three, I can get um, all of the third column. If I wanted to extract a single column as a vector, I can do this double square brackets. Um, you can also use the dollar sign to access them, and, and most most people find that a more readable way of doing so. And just like with matrices, the square brackets can take two arguments. So the first thing is the row, and the second thing is the columns. So here I'm asking for just the first three rows and all the columns. So another way I could look at some middle portion of these data without the head and tail 
is is just looking at you know I arbitrarily chose those two row indices asking for uh, a range from there and uh, unlike when I access a single row from a matrix the single row from a data frame will still be a data frame because of the mixed types. So I can't convert this down into a, a matrix or a vector because some of these are factors, some of these are characters, some of these are numbers. Questions about um, data subsetting. So I went through a bunch. We have our uh, square brackets, we have our slices, we have our arbitrary um, combinations of data and uh, dollar signs as well. And also we need to remember that indexing in R starts at one and not zero. All right, I'm going to continue on to uh, a brief section on control flow. So R allows you to write um, conditional statements so that you can perform actions based on some test. This is really common uh, in computing and in programming languages. The two most common ways in which you would probably uh, engage in this are if else's and for uh, constructs. And so here's the, the, the form of an if or an FS, if else statement is I would write the special word if and then um, in parentheses test if some condition is true or not. And if that is true, R will execute everything in between the uh, squiggly brace, braces or brackets that I write. And um, if I want to test if some condition is true and if not perform some other action, the, I can add the additional else portion of this uh, control and I can perform you know, some alternative action there. So a relatively straightforward example of this is you know, I have some variable uh, that's numeric and I want to test if it is greater or less than some number and in this case if I'm asking is x greater than or equal to 10 uh, if so print this number out and I won't print it out because it is not I'll just print out the value because I typed it here. Uh, I could expand this out to be an if l statement uh, like this where if this if this test fails then do the thing in the else part. And in this case, I'm printing out x is less than 10. And so you'll see that x actually does, uh, well, you'll see that I print out x is less than 10 because it made it to this portion of that block. You can chain together multiple tests, although you have to be careful. Uh, you can say, you know, is x greater than or equal to 10? And then if that fails, uh, do this test. And then finally, if, I, if none of those tests works, finally print that. Uh, and so on the... Um, The thing that can sometimes tr trip you up is uh, let's try this. So I get this strange 
4 equals 3 is false because uh, the whole vector x is false. And um, you just have to watch out because the what what R is expecting in the uh, if statement will um, usually need to be some sort of a logical. Oh yeah, if else is um, a neat little function that sort of performs an if statement in vector form. So you can do something simple like recreate an if statement. Oh, I also have to define define y here. So in a single line, I can run um, an if else. this oops I've been doing too much Python lately I can actually run if else on a vector and it'll um, perform those actions on each uh, each item and so the way that if else works is um, I pass to it a test, and then the, uh, the statement that would have gone in that first portion of my if statement would go here, and then the other action or the else part goes as, this, as the other option, which is it's kind of neat. You can sort of vectorize your if, if else. Uh, a nice thing to combine with if statements is the any and all functions. So any will return true if at least one value in a vector is true. And all requires that all values in a vector are true. Questions about ifs, ands or buts? No, okay, four. Four is a really nice way of um, executing some operation on every uh, value or, or for some set duration. So the first, first example of this would be, you know, a very typical four i some index variable in a length uh, in, a, in a range of values here from one to ten. Um, I just print i, so you see I'm printing out 1 to 10. Uh, you can also nest for loops, where here I'm asking uh, r to, for each number in this vector from 1 to 5, assign that value to i, and then for each character value in this combined vector, assign that to j, and paste those together as i and j. And so you'll see the first time that this loop runs, I get 1 and a. So it'll take 1 and a and paste them together. Because this is an inner loop, I haven't run all the way through this loop once before assigning a new value to i. So the next time that this loop runs, I get 1 and b. So I still have 1, but then I get b. And then I get 1 and c. I want a D, I want an E, and so on and so forth. I go back to 2A. So this inner loop finishes once, and I go back to the outer loop. And so this is a nice way of um, combining uh, two vectors. It's also nested loops are a great way to, to really slow down computation. So um, I encourage, let's see. I encourage you, um, if you are using four, 
loops to wherever possible, anticipate the size and shape of the result that you're creating with them and uh, pre-allocate the results for that. An example here would be uh, if I am going through some computation and calculating uh, results that are going to be pasted into a five by five matrix, what I could do is create a matrix ahead of time and uh, then all R has to worry about is computing those and storing those values into the output matrix. R is really bad at um, recreating and making copies of variables over and over again. And nested for loops are a great way to, to really um, punish yourself by making R do a thing it's not great at over and over again, um, sort of exponentially. A little aside, um, while loops, I oftentimes, especially in, in a scientific context where you have some piece of data or a set of data that you want to do something to, and when you're done, you have a result. While loops might not be the um, first thing to reach for, but just to know that they exist, you can have R continue doing something while some condition is true. And as long as you eventually do change um, that condition by some action inside that while loop, it will finish. Questions about if, else, and for. Okay. Gonna hop on to vectorization and then um, really quickly just show you how to write out data and then we'll be finished for the day. So, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So, um, vectorization is again um, our. Rob, whose name starts with R, mentioned this earlier in the lessons, but uh, R is, is fastest and easiest to read when you make use of its vectorized functions, meaning you tell R to do one thing and it performs multiple things at a time. And the simplest example of this, I believe you were already shown where uh, I'm creating a vector of multiple values and multiplying that by a single value. And what ends up happening is every single value in that vector ends up being multiplied. And the same is true of the, the plus symbol. All of those sort of basic mathematical operators are vectorized. And you can imagine what's actually happening, uh, you know, for each of these is, is, is taking that single value and, and um, multiplying or, or adding it accordingly. You can also add or multiply or divide two vectors together. You can start to do um, sort of matrix math, uh, again, with the same symbols. So it's a really straightforward way of, of being able to combine functions together. And the part of the reason why this is fast is uh, computer CPUs have special ways of speeding up exactly these kinds of calculations. And so where um, you, know, you could write a for loop that would sort of iterate through each of these indices and add these numbers separately, that for loop will probably be orders of magnitude slower, especially on larger pieces of data than using the vectorized version. Because uh, when you do this, R knows that it can run some optimizations that it can't necessarily anticipate when you're just running a for loop. Uh, and so here I'm just talking about that. Uh, again, 
what's actually happening for those comparisons that I showed you earlier, those are also vectorized. So I'm comparing two to every element in X all at once and getting that uh, logical operator. Again, want to call out the any and all, which are helpful in constructing those logical operators. Um, log is another example of a function that can perform uh, you know, its expected computation on a vector. So you could pass a single value to log, or you can pass a vector, and it will return a vector of the same shape where it performed its function on each of the individual portions of your vector. And matrices work the same way because they are uh, underneath. They're just vectors to begin with. So here I'm just multiplying uh, a matrix of all positive numbers by negative one to make them all negative numbers. Uh, and for those of you familiar with the dot notation of, of matrices, um, if you actually want to do matrix multiplication, multiplying two matrices together as, as you would, um, you have to use this, again, um, kind of wacky looking operator, the per percent sign asterisk percent sign. We'll do the matrix math that you would expect. Um, that's all I have on vectorizing things and sort of a specific call out to those as um, efficient and uh, elegant ways of, of performing computation. Are there any questions about uh, vectorized functions? I, I go a little bit more into this and also into why certain for loops can be really, really bad in the other R course that we give um, called, oh shoot, let me look it up right now. Here's a call out to our training. Uh, writing efficient R code, which um, will be next held April 22nd. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's just a tiny bit of overlap, but go sort of more deeply into when and why you should care about performance in R. No more questions about that. Okay, so finally, um, I want to touch on, so you've performed your analysis, you've sliced and diced your, your uh, data set or your data frame or however you stored it into something that you then you know, either want to save so that you can give it to someone or save so that you can continue work at a later date. Uh, the simplest way of doing this and the most straightforward is saving it to a plain text file. And you can do that by writing it out with the write dot table function. And you can sort of think about this function as the inverse of read.table. So uh, you, you pass write.table, then um, the name of a data frame and the name of a file, and then how you would like it to be separated. There's some other options you can you can specify as well. Uh, and the nice thing is you can, you know, take a larger chunk of data and, you know, say I just wanted to, to save the Australia portion of my data set as a separate file to send off to someone who is just going to do Australia specific analyses. I can give them just what they need um, in a relatively straightforward way. I can subset that save it as a new data frame and write it out as a new table um, in CSV form by just saying, I want the separator or the sep option to the write.table function to be comma. And what I end up with, if I do so, is something that looks like this. And so why might this not quite be what I wanted? Can anyone spot? Uh, spot some things that maybe are not needed about the way that these data were printed out. 
Yeah, so it looks like country is now numbers in quotation marks. Uh, what R does is, I've always found kind of frustrating, it prints out a, um, you'll notice that there's actually one fewer uh, column than there are number of elements every row afterwards. It maintains and prints out the original indices for your data in a CSV file with if you don't ask it not to. Um, this can be convenient if you wanted to read this back in and cared about exactly which row your data came from. But usually when I'm read, writing data out, I don't care anymore. Uh, you know, you can call the question mark write table or you can look up the documentation on this um, and add some additional options to write.table to do what I think should be the defaults, but they don't agree with me, so uh, this is what we have to deal with. I can call the write.table function on, again, here I'm actually just on the fly uh, subsetting my data, or I could also uh, use the, the variable that I define called ost underscore subset, either are fine. I'm telling it the name of the file I want it to output to, I'm naming the separator, but now I'm also telling it to not surround everything with quotes and to exclude the row names. So after doing this, I get something that looks a lot more like the kind of data that I could both import back into R without much trouble or you know, send to someone else, open in Excel, um, do whatever I like to it, and um, sort of take R out of the equation. I think that is, yeah, that's everything. That's the end of write.table. Now you need everything you need to, now you have everything you need to know. Uh, thank you all for bearing with Rob and I. Uh, this was our first time giving this class and it was also uh, one of our very first Zoom only classes. So feedback on how we can do these things better, we would really appreciate and also feedback on this specific course. We really appreciate what, uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, and how uh, you'd like to see it change in the future. Christine, did you have a, uh, what's it called, link to the, the survey? Or are we just going to email that out to folks? Okay, so uh, Christine's gonna send that out. And thank you for that feedback, Sarah. Um, it would be good to give maybe a few more concrete scientific examples as well. I'd just like to add, uh, Ben, if I could just add my two cents. Thank you to everyone sure. sticking with us. And um, I echo Ben's comments that um, this is all very new to us. So. Uh, any feedback you have is welcome, and um, I really appreciate you guys sticking through the three hours. Uh, so we're pretty much at time. I'll let everyone go. We're available. Uh, Christine's going to send out the links to the survey, and you know, if you ever have questions, you can also email us at hpc at yale.edu. Um, with questions about, you know, your actual science and your projects, and we can help you with that as well. So with that, thank you very much. And um, everyone is free to go. We're going to close the meeting uh, relatively soon.